Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card for this Saturday, uh, October 19th, pardon me, November 19th, and we're going to be analyzing it strictly from a DFS, uh, DraftKings perspective. Um, in addition, as we did last week, we are going to do a separate video, probably released tomorrow, strictly uh, analyzing it from a betting perspective, and for those of you that watched last week, that was a lot of fun. Um, we We debuted our, our picks in fine style. I think we won like eight units, as the kids like to say. And for those of you that watched, I mean, we definitely take an unorthodox approach to the betting uh, piece of MMA. Unorthodox for most people, but very orthodox for me, because it is exactly the way that I analyze all sports bets and all stock bets and everything like that. So hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed that and we're gonna continue doing that uh, every week. Uh, but this card is going to be, this video is specifically dedicated to DFS. And uh, let's let's review the big change that occurred in DFS over the last couple of days. In that uh, for MMA slates, you can now late swap, meaning that if you, uh, you know, put your lineup in and you want to change something after the fights have started, as long as your fight hasn't, as long as this one particular fight hasn't started yet, you can feel free to change whoever you want. Um, not to get into too much of the industry history of this, but a lot of people were sort of complaining that, you know, that you locked in all of your, your, your fighters at, at, you know, beginning of the first fight and someone got, if someone pulls out, um, after fight locks, it basically ruins your whole night. And even though that only happened a few times, uh, people really just thought it would be fair to give you, give yourself an opportunity to swap off of that fighter. So, I mean, DK listened, but they didn't hear. <laughs> like they, 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 they said, okay, no problem. We're going to let you guys all late swap. Uh, we'll give little sort of fight times for each fight. Those are obviously very rough. And as long as, you know, I guess your, your swap occurs before that fight goes off then then you're okay. So it, it solved one problem, but created another. Uh, the problem it created was that now what's going to happen is that really, really sharp people with computers and, and, and algorithms and models will figure out a way to leverage knowledge of who other people have taken already to basically create a late swap algorithm and a late swap tool that will give them a significant edge over people who don't do that. I don't want to get into all the details about that, but you, you can feel free though to, to take solace in this in that to do that will require people to be in front of their computer for the entirety of an MMA card on a Saturday night. Um, so boy, oh boy, that that's, that's a rough sell for me. You want to know the truth. I mean, even if you told me that I was going to generate like an extra five, 10% EV by, but I have to trade that in for, being in front of the computer, not only being in front of the computer all night on a Saturday night, but also, you know, having the ability to develop the tools to to generate that 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 ownership model. Um, I don't know if it's worth it for me. Um, but the question you always have to ask yourself is, is well, I know it's not worth it for me, but the question you have to ask yourself is it worth it for you to play anyway, knowing that other people are just are going to be doing that. Maybe not as many as you might think, but maybe more than you think also. I don't know what you think. So um, I'm going to leave it to you to how to how to respond to this change with respect to how much you want to play. OK, that's that's really up to you. But I will say that it's definitely an advantage to being at the computer and, and, and making late swaps uh, strategically. Um, it's not something that I'm going to support from a content perspective zero chance I'm doing that. And for my own play, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I will say this, that I'm definitely not going to play 150. Um, I, I, and I, it's funny, I just actually gotten that mojo of, of like, liking to play the 150 lineups, but it's just, it's just too much work, you know? Uh, and, and, and if I'm not going to stay in front of this, the computer, at least some of the time during the fights, if I know that 150 lineups are getting eaten up by EV, that's the, it's kind of difficult for me. I mean, may, maybe I'll play less lineups. I honestly don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I mean, look, 
who, who am I kidding? I'm still going to play. But um, it definitely makes things a little more challenging. But for now, uh, until this thing shakes out, we figure out exactly how to handle this. Um, I'm going to go over the fights as, as normal, but I will throw one other kind of caveat in. Well, if those of you who have seen my videos on other sports, it's always an advantage when you have late swap to have you know decisions at, at your disposal. Right. So what that means is that the more fights that you have, uh, the more you can push back your exposures to the later fights, the better off you're going to be because it, it gives you more flexibility to change based on what else has happened in the card. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that it's also possible because of that, those fights are going to be much higher owned because other people are going to do the same thing. But again, that's just, only time will tell to see how that shakes out. But I think from now, what we can do is we will give extra weight to the late fight in the analysis. Okay. Hopefully that makes some sense. So this is a really uh, pretty big card, like 13 fights. And from a talent perspective, it's not the best. And from a DraftKings perspective, it's very, it's very normal. I mean, you have some fights that have, uh, you know, a very strong inside the distance props, but most of them don't. You have some fights that have some striker versus grappler matchup where the win condition uh, is, 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 is what you need to consider. In other words, you'd want to, all else being equal, pick the, grap pick the grappler wrestler over the striker, um, especially when there's no inside the distance prop worth mentioning because those fighters tend to score better if, in fact, it does go to a decision. And there are some dud fights as well. So let's just kind of, let's get into it. Now we're going to use the, the, the combination of DraftKings uh, salary, uh, the DraftKings lobby and uh, best fight odds. And we're going to start with uh, Natalie Silva versus Teresa Bleda. Um, this is a uh, women's fight to, to prospect. So you have prospects. There is quite a bit of volatility in that in general, you know, because, you know, when, whenever you, you're, you're young, you have, a, you know, all this potential and, at any moment that can just kind of kind of pop you know so that's something to consider so you have silva at minus 170 and first thing i want to look is make sure that it's not a, a price gap price a misprice no as a matter of fact it looks to be somewhat efficient um i guess if anything i would say maybe silva is a little overpriced but not by much um so i think there's no pricing problem here Let's take a look at the inside the distance prop and the inside the distance prop is not particularly good. You have um, Silva inside the distance is plus 300. That's not good at all for a, for a minus for an 8,900 fighter. Um, and Blada really doesn't have much either. Blada inside the distance is minus 900 or plus 900. And with respect to the to the wrestling, you could make the case, I guess, that either of them have wrestling upside. You know, you you've seen a little bit out of both fighters, so um, I guess from a win condition perspective, you can make the case that Blade is kind of okay um, because she has shown some grappling. The only thing is, and this is one thing that I've learned, is that. Sometimes it's not enough to just have wrestling and takedowns. You also need to be able to do something with those takedowns once you get them. Um, even if it means like tiny little pitter patter strikes on the ground, um, that's good enough. But just to be able to take the person down and just kind of blanket them is not, does not provide the ceiling really needed on a 13 fight slate. You know, may, maybe if she were seven K, I would make that case a little bit better. So I think overall, I think that this fight is sort of, it's sort of a pass. Um, and considering again, that it's first fight of the night and there's late swap, I feel as though that it's even more of a pass. Um, however, to, uh, the, uh, the opposing view is that as you mentioned earlier, sheets, it's, it's a women's fight with prospects. So there is a bit of upside for both fighters, I guess. So I could see a variation where Silva just dominates and gets a you know, pretty good score and a finish. And you could see, a, I guess, a variation where Blada does get, you know, a bunch of takedowns. But I think that if I had to 
pick one side, it would probably be a little more on the side of Silva. But as we'll get to, you just have better options that are deeper down the card, further up the card, I guess, um, at the same price with better inside the distance props than Silva here. So I'll make Silva, I guess, technically, officially a fringe play. Blade, probably a super fringe play. But overall, I think the fight is not the greatest. So now we get to Brady Heastan versus Freddy Garcia. So this fight, I mean, unfortunately, or fortunately, this fight is, is kind of an easy one to break down. You, you have Heastan is a minus 180-ish, okay? And, and you look at the price, and he's only 8,500. So you already have, like, pretty, pretty decent size line value in his price. And if that weren't enough, his entire path to victory is DraftKings gold. I mean, he is a, a stone-cold wrestler continuing to press and go for takedowns. So this is literally everything that you want. Not everything, because it's not a great, you know, there's, not, there's no real finishing upside. Um, but you have, you have line value and you have perfect win condition. This is basically your classic um mma play on DraftKings, but i really also say that even the win even the inside the distance prop isn't bad so you have he winning inside the distance is actually plus 275 and that's not bad either for that price that plus the takedown upside plus the line value and this is it's kind of a theoretical lock if you think about it uh, the only thing, uh, two things going against it is, number one, I imagine it will be highly owned. And number two, um, that it's early in the card. So, again, you, you don't have any uh, flexibility to swap off it if things aren't going your way or are going your way or whatever. But I don't think that matters in, in this case. I think he stands, obviously, I mean, again, he's only going to win, you know, whatever, 60% of the time. So, I don't say he's a lock in that sense, but as far as a DK play goes, I mean, it just, it honestly doesn't get any better than that. So um, I think in single entry, you want to start with this, with this fighter. I think in three max, you want to start with this fighter. I think in 20 max, you want to have this in a significant amount of your lineups. And when you, when you get into like the 150 max and stuff, and you have to worry about ownership uh, a little bit more then uh, you can start fading it. But I think it's very, very difficult to fade. Um, and Garcia, I mean, Garcia, you know, the internals are really, really poor. I mean, he's got a inside the distance prop of my, plus 800, you know. So, uh, and then the the, the converse of the line uh, value for Brady Heastan, it's a negative line value for Garcia. Now, because of all that, he's going to be probably 5% owned. So you certainly can get leverage if, if Heastan somehow gets knocked out. Um, but aside from that, it, everything about it is kind of a fourth play. Okay, Oliveira versus Demopolis. You have one minus one ten versus minus one ten. Let's take a look at the pricing. It's pretty, pretty, pretty safe. It's pretty, pretty clean. Eighty two hundred eight k. Not a big deal. Take a look at the inside the distance prop. Both are really, really poor. Um, actually, Oliveira is really poor. Oliveira's inside the distance prop is plus nine hundred. Where Demopoulos' prop is actually pretty fair at plus 300. That's actually not bad. Um, because she does get submissions. And, and the other thing is that she does have the possibility of getting some takedowns. So the combination of her takedown upside plus her inside the distance prop, I think at 83, I think at, at 8,200, I think she makes her a pretty, pretty decent play here. Um, is it as good a play as I stand well they're sort of different prices so that's not exactly fair but I definitely think that Demopolis is the is the side here in DFS and again uh and the the, the difference here is that Oliviera I don't think is a particularly good play and you're not going to get exactly the same type of leverage as you would be playing someone like Garcia so I think Oliviera is probably a probably a pretty decent sized fade if not a full fade so just for fun I mean let's let's put um let's put her in too Let's see if we can't, you know, kind of build something just based on best plays. But remember, in the end, we prefer fights to be later. 
So this is uh, something arguing against this. Okay, Miles John versus Vince Morales. You have minus 170-ish versus plus 140-ish. So let's take a look and see if the prices give us any break here. Um, oh, we skipped one. We'll get back to it. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, something similar. Miles John is only 8,400. Boy, you're getting line value on Miles Johns here. I mean, Miles Johns at a minus 170-ish. I guess it's not that bad. I mean, it's it's I mean it's pretty much the same as he stand, right? And he stand was what? Uh 8,500. And Miles Johns is 8,400. So I guess that's pretty similar. Um, I think that I think that. This Miles John is actually a very similar type of deal to Houston. I barely noticed that. Uh, minus 170 is should be closer to 8,700, honestly. Um, and so that's 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 one thing. The other thing about the Miles John side, I mean, look, the, the inside the distance prop of, of both fighters which is pretty poor, specifically Morales. Morales inside the distance is plus a million. And John's inside the distance is actually pretty good. It's plus 220. Plus, Miles Johns also has some takedown upside. From what I've heard from the from the content and from their research this week, I mean, he does have a significant amount of, of wrestling in his back pocket. It's just up to him whether he uses it or not. So I think the combination of, of, of those two things, the line value plus his inside distance prop plus his um, wrestling upside makes him a pretty good play. Um Again, what's going against it is it's an early fight. But aside from that, I, mean, I think we're starting off with three pretty pretty good plays here. Um, and I think three pretty solid fades in Garcia, Oliveira, and Morales. Okay. Um, Tercios versus Natividad. Um, I'll have more to say to this in the betting breakdown, I think, but Let's let's just rely on the numbers here for a minute. So so Tercios is a minus one sixty ish, depending on where you look, and his price on DraftKings is about eighty six hundred. Um, that seems kind of, that seems fair. Uh, with respect to inside the distance, you have pretty poor internals. You have uh, Tercios by Inside the distance is plus 400. Yikes. And Nativity inside this is plus like 400 as well. That's just really awful. The one thing, well, there's a couple of things, is Tercios does have the ability to put up a lot of volume. Um, it's just a question of whether he does it or not. Uh, he also does have the capability to get takedowns. And if you want kind of a narrative-based approach to this fight, in his last fight, he did nothing. Um, and that was, it was it, like a noticeable nothing. Like he basically swung at the air for three rounds. And he had this reputation coming out of the Ultimate Fighter as being someone extremely active. Um, and the WF, the UFC wanted him back right away. So I think they might have given him a speech and said, you know what, you better bring your, bring your, bring your shit. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that Tercios' internals might be a little bit underrated so if you want kind of like what i think could be a low owned play who doesn't have the greatest internals on, on paper is maybe tercios so just for now i will put him in the, in, in, the, in the lineup i think there'll be better plays but i i definitely think that he's in play here people really have a, a probably a, a bad taste in their mouth from having played him last time i mean he really was just awful um and natividad just doesn't show anything in the internals or anything to be be worth my my uh my exposure here okay uh maya versus morose so you have minus 180 or 185 so that should be about 8900 ish and she's actually 9k so you know no bargain there um, let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. You have really, really poor, as you might imagine. Morose inside the distance is plus 400. That's just awful for a 9K fighter. Maya is plus a billion. Um, 
you could say though that Morose has some takedown upside. When you look back at her previous fights, see two takedowns, two takedowns, one takedown. I don't know though. Um, this, the, I like this. The, the 139 significant strikes and the 170. See, this is what you want out of a takedown uh, fighter. Someone that will get the takedowns and pound away with them. And 111 will want. Um, and even this last fight, two takedowns and a sub is 108. I mean, that's not bad either. Um, but how often does that happen? I mean, she's plus 400 to do that, you know? But maybe you get this one at 111. You know what? I originally was going to fade her, but I think the takedown upside might put her in play. But it's definitely not a superior play yet. So I'm, I'm going to leave her out for now. But I will at least in, in, the, in the player pool, uh, I won't fade her completely. And Maya just Maya just does nothing for me. So we will uh, continue on. Uh, where are we? Okay, Charles Johnson versus Zuma Gulov. So this one's another sort of easy one. Um, so you have Charles Johnson at minus 165-ish. So he should be what, about 8,600? Let's take a look. And he is about 8,700. About, you know, reasonable, maybe a little overvalued, about, about you know, probably normal. Juma Gulak, maybe a little undervalued, I guess. John, John should be a little overvalued. Uh, Juma Gulak, maybe a little undervalued, but not much. But look at the inside the distance props. You have Charles Johnson, who inside the distance is plus 300. Um, plus 300 at 8,700. I mean, just compare that to Miles Johns. Miles Johns is 8,400 and he was a plus 210. You know, um, you had who's another guy, you even had he stand who was plus 300 with the takedown upside, you know, so. I just don't think Johnson is is kind of is, is such a great play here. Um, maybe well, listen when you get up to one fifties, maybe, but I, I don't think in your main build you're gonna want that. But Juma Gulov, I mean, his you know, his his complete win condition play. I mean, he's his entire path to victory is gonna be takedowns and control time. Um, so the fact is that even though his inside the distance prop is is miserable, what is it? It's 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 plus. They don't even list it how bad it is. Uh, just I can't find it here, but trust me, it's 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 uh, inside the distance is plus plus a billion. Oh, there it is, plus nine hundred, right? But he's not winning unless he gets, doesn't get takedowns. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I guess he could win by just clinching up or something like that. Um, but in in a slate where, well, like all slates, where you could use an underdog. He definitely seems very logical. So we're, we're, we're going to put him in as, as our first very legit underdog because he's only a plus 140 to get the job done. And in those fights, he gets the job done. He probably does enough to pay it off. Not always, but probably. So I guess that's, uh, I guess that's good. Um, okay. Moving up the card. Uh, Jack. Della Maddalena versus Danny Roberts. So you have one of those fights, which, you know, DraftKings just doesn't really know how to price. Um, you have a plus, minus 560, who probably, guys should probably be 11,000 or whatever, but um, they made him 9,600. But, you know, it's because it's dynamic, it's, there's not real dynamic pricing. So Della Maddalena, I mean, he's going to win the fight like, a bunch of times. And if you look at the, Inside the distance prop, he's basically pick him to win in the first round. And so let's take a look at this. Uh, Madeline inside the distance is minus, you know, basically 175. And then if you even look at to look at this fight starts round two is basically a pick them. You actually have to lay a little bit of wood that it that it starts round two, but not much. So obviously Magdalena looks like a strong play, but 9600 is tough, man. I mean, think think of what you really need 
for 9,600. I mean, he's got to, I mean, okay, this is what you need in general. You need someone, if he's going to pay up 9,600, he or she, to either get a first round KO within one minute. That'll do it. You need a, or you can get a first round KO, which is accompanied by a bunch of strikes or a takedown. In other words, it's not enough to just go out there, you know, jab around, and then after, you know, a minute, just get a, a combination KO. That'll get you 100, but 100 is not going to be enough for 9,600, okay? You're going to need 110, 120. And, and the other way you can get 110 or 20 is be someone that is going to be a consistent grappler and ground and pounder, like what's your name from last week, like, like Blanchfield, you know? that it's almost better the fight, longer the fight goes on as far as fantasy points go. Um, but Magdalena doesn't have that. What Magdalena has is, is really, really you know, good knockout power. And I, I just worry that his knockout power is just kind of too good. That he'll, you know, that, that, that Roberts will last a minute and then Magdalena will get the KO, get 98 points or 104 points, and then just bust. So I really believe that for DraftKings purposes, on a 13-fight card, it's probably a poor play. Um, but that's, uh, again, I, I approach this, uh, that type of price range a little bit differently. But, let's, but let's, go back to, let's go back to the other thing I said earlier. I mentioned that, oh, it looks like a great play. He's about 50-50 to win in the first round. Or the fight's 50-50. Well, you know what that means? That, that already 50% of the time this fight's busted. You know what I mean? I mean, you think of it another way. I mean, he's going to be probably popular, at least to some degree. I don't know what people are going to really do. I mean, it's, it's but he's got to be 30% plus, right, with, with those internals. So I feel as though, you know, if 50% of the time he busts, and even if the 50% of the time he wins in the first round, he doesn't necessarily get there. I, I just I just, I just, just think it's, it's, it's a poor play. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe in cash, you, you do take this, the safe money, but I think in GPPs, I, 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 this, that's not the way I would go. Um, in in 150s, I'll definitely get to him. Maybe even in some 20 maxes, I'll get to him. But in a weird way, it's also kind of early in the card <laughs> um, to, to commit 9,600. Um, okay, so... Oh, and obviously, uh, there's a poet... I, I, can't, you can't bet guys in DFS that will have you know twenty percent winning chance. It's just it's just it's just poor business. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, Salikov versus Fialo. Um, okay, so it's about a pick 'em fight. So you expect it to be eighty one hundred. As a matter of fact, no, it's about pick 'em. So you expect it to be eight k eight k, but you actually see a little bit of line value in Fialo, right? And we talked about that earlier. Um, he should be 8K, uh, excuse me, 8,100, right? So it should be 8,100, 8,100, but it's actually 79.83. So you're actually getting a little bit of line value out of Fialo. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is you look at the inside the distance prop, you have Salikov, for example, inside the distance is plus 300. And you see what I'm doing with this, by the way? I'm just trying to split the difference in the VIG to give a kind of a real, real life uh, idea of what these, you know, what what their actual chances of pulling this off are. So plus 300 for Salikov. And then if you look, you have Fialo is like plus 200. So Fialo, despite him being the, 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 the DraftKings underdog, has a better inside the distance prop than Salikov. Um, you, you factor that in plus, you know, possible takedown upside. Um, I don't know. This looks like a really, really strong play. Um, with respect to Salikov, again, depending how ownership comes in, I, I do have a kind of a sneaky suspicion that Salikov is live here. Um, just because of the way he fights, he does kind of like like to load up on shots. And, you know, he throws it really, really hard. And, and um, that wouldn't pique my interest that much if he were chalk. Or, you know what I mean? But because Fialo, I think he rates to be pretty popular, right? Like if he if he's getting the 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 win the, the the line odds and he's got the better inside the distance prop and he's you know what I mean, he's a shorter price. 
uh, on, on DraftKings. I would imagine he's going to be pretty popular. So I do think that Salikov has a um, has some sneaky GPP leverage in this spot. Um, so I think that both sides of this are very, very playable. Um, by the way, you'll see already that you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what you can play here. I mean, what I've, what I've done kind of with the shell is, you know, just put some stuff in. But remember, we haven't even gotten to the late fights yet, you know? And, and the late fights are usually where most of the action is. And, and not only that, but now that there's late swap, it's just so much more important to have those fights available to you to swap and swap off of and things like that. So, um, But uh, I do think that both sides of this fight are very, very playable. Okay, so now you get to Enjiku versus uh, Kudalabin, and these are the fights you're going to want to... Excuse me, we're not there yet, sorry. You have... Well, the last three we could talk about all together. You're going to talk about all three of these last fights that all have very strong inside the distance props, and they are all late. So these are... And then you go back to the last one. So you, let's say the last four fights, this Fialo fight, not to mention the Magdalena, you have the last basically five fights on the card have the five best inside the distance props. I mean, think about that. Before you start like speculating on some of these earlier fights, I mean, think about that. I mean, you you could honestly play the last five fights on this card and 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 take and you'll have the five best inside the distance props. And you know, as long as you're willing to take the underdogs in those fights, um I, you could certainly then you could just go root against you know these other everybody else. Um but I think at the very, but then again, you know, if you just take the underdogs, you don't give yourself any room, any real flexibility, you know, uh, if you're just left with those five fights at the end. But what you can do is if you have those five fights and and the, you know, the fight one, somebody smashes that you didn't have, then you could swap from, say, Spivak to Lewis or somebody like that um, in these kind of key fights that happen to be at the end. All right, so let's just go back. Uh Acosta versus Sherman. All right, we're going to talk about this when we get to the when we get to the betting breakdown. But let's 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 for the purposes of DraftKings presume that all these odds are right and all these props are right. That's that, that's what you're supposed to do. So you have Acosta versus Sherman. We have a minus two thirty, and he is, should be about ninety one, ninety two hundred, which he is. And this is not deja vu. In other words, you feel as though he just fought. And he did. It was like two weeks ago. He was against Vandera, who is, you know, the other, he's going to, the other uh, just awful heavyweight, at least the way the public looks at him, who actually fought Sherman a few, few months ago, back in July. And you have him as a two to one favorite plus over Sherman. And we'll take a look at the inside the distance prop here. You have Acosta is basically a pick them to finish inside the distance. See that minus 110, minus 120? So about 50% of the time he finishes um, Sherman. So at 9,100, that would seem to be, you know, pretty fair, right, to say the least. But the thing is, is that, number one, he's got no upside other than chaos um, with respect to drafting score. I mean, he he's he's – does not have any semblance of takedowns, no semblance of grappling, whatever it is. And I mean, I have to say that he looked rather pedestrian in his last fight. You know, again, I don't want to put my take on this, but he was against Vandera, and they were saying that Vandera was going to get KO'd by this dude like in the first round. And he looked really not that great, if you want to know the truth. I mean, he, uh, he looked like, you know what he looked like? He looked like a boxer. That's what he is. Um, but I don't know. Uh, this 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 is going to be one of those where maybe do as I do say not as I do because I don't know this look the internals are strong you know inside the distance is good but boy would you rather have him at ninety one hundred or I don't know I mean he is a full two point two to one favorite that's the distance that's the difference to him and some of these others I guess he's I guess he's fine I guess according to the internals I guess he makes sense he's still. Coming off of two weeks, you know, two weeks of rest after getting his legs chopped out against Sherman, who was basically in a full camp fighting for about to fight a Parisian who had to pull out of, of that fight. So I don't know. It's listen, it should, should, should come as no surprise who I'm gonna 
Maybe it should come as a surprise. Um, who I'm going to take in my betting betting breakdown? Maybe maybe we'll we'll talk about that when it gets to. But um, this is it seems like a ridiculous line, um, honestly. But that's not for me to say. According to the numbers, Acosta is a pretty reasonable play, but I'm probably not going to play him. I think the Sherman is not the worst idea in the world, is it? I mean, what's his inside the distance probably plus four fifty? I don't know. The, the The internals are really are really arguing with me here, so I'll probably pass on it for now. But I will say this. Oh, but I will say this. If I say have a lineup with like Derek Lewis, uh, in in uh, in the main event. And something's going not going my way, and I need a little more juice. And I can swap from say Derek Lewis to Sherman, who's going to be much lower owned. I would definitely take a shot, um, but only if I'm put in that position, because Sherman's inside the distance probably is pretty poor. But we'll, we'll get to we'll get to Derek Lewis in a second. Um, should I replace any of these guys? No, I don't think so. I still I still think that that. On the surface, these are still the six best plays. He Stan, Demopoulos, Johns, Tercios, Jumagula, Fiala. I think those are still the best plays. I think they're better plays than the Sherman or Acosta. Um, okay, and Shuku versus Kutalaba. Let's take a look at the odds. We have minus 180-ish, so I presume he should be about 8,900 or so. And he is about 8,800. Fair enough. Take a look at the inside the distance props here on both these fighters. You have Enchukwu inside the distance is a very healthy, almost a pick em, like a plus 110. I know you think about that. You compare that to, um, to Acosta, who is basically this, he was, who's, who's more expensive. Um, you know, Enchukwu is just going to be a better play. You know, than than a than a custom, um, and you could pair that, for example, to even to Tercios, who I was trying to make a case for. I mean, Tercios was much much poorer. You know, I I only use Tercios as an example of probably something of a pivot. Like Tercios, at well, he's a little bit cheaper, but his inside the distance prop, for example, is was it plus four hundred or something like that. Yeah, plus like four, plus four fifty. No, plus uh, plus like four hundred. I was only using him as a pivot. I think that 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 Inchuk was a very very strong play here. Um, he also has a little bit of sneaky takedown upside. Um, so uh, I like that. Um, so I think he's really really strong. As far as Kutalaba goes, um, I think his inside the distance prop is probably going to be pretty poor. I think we'll take a look at it, but just because. I don't know. Wait a minute. Plus 260. I got to tell you, at 7,400, that's really, really strong. I mean, I, I can't find, well, we'll get to one in a second. But at 7,400, uh, there, there's nothing like that on this card. If you want to know the truth. So I think that Kutalaba as an underdog is actually pretty in play. And especially, listen, again, if you do some kind of, you know, hokey pokey with the last couple of fights, and let's say you have one pairing of, say, Nchukwu with with, with uh, Derek Lewis, and then it comes down to it, you want to swap to, to Spivak and uh, and Kutalaba for whatever reason, once you do your calculations or whatever, certainly do that as well. So I think that both these fighters are firmly in play. Um, I definitely, again, for the purposes of our, our shell, I will replace Tertios with Enchuku. Um, so once again, we, we have like some plays here, including, you know, two, two underdogs. Uh, uh, and could be three, like Zumagulov could be replaced by Kutalaba if we don't play, you know, if we don't play Enchuku. So now let's go to the main event. That would be Spivak versus Derek Lewis. And I will tell you right now that in a vacuum, Spurs searching Spivak is probably like both these guys are kind of theoretical locks. I mean, I think about it. So Spivak is minus 200 ish. So he should be about 9K. 
and he is right at 9200 a little low expensive i guess but look at the inside the distance props here you have he is hold on we'll get there Sergey Spivak inside the distance is minus 130, accounting for big. But not only that, he is firmly in play for multiple takedowns. As a matter of fact, one could say that that's his only way to win this, is this is his path to victory. Multiple takedowns followed by ground and pound finish. Okay? There's no way that this fight is going five rounds. It's just not happening. Um, and the, the inside the distance prop kind of kind of bears that out. I think it's like minus 800, something like that. So for Spivak to win, it's not going to be by decision. It's going to be by a whole bunch of takedowns. And the only thing I think you really have to worry about if you play Spivak are those variations where, where maybe he gets one takedown around, doesn't go for full ground and pound, and then just kind of wins in round three, maybe. But I just I just don't see the world that Spivak's, you know, that's the only thing is that I don't think they're going to, Derek Lewis is going to be able to be taken down six times because by that time he'll be finished, you know. Um, but it's an extremely strong play. I mean, it just is. I mean, and it's, and it's a late fight and all that. He's, I think that he's definitely the best player on this slate. Uh, and even at 9,200. The, uh, you could make the argument, though, that the second best play on the slate might be Derek Lewis. Why, why on earth would that be? Well, he is, first of all, he has a little bit of line value, right? He's, he's plus 155, 160-ish, and he's being priced as maybe plus 180, 190, and only 7K. But this, this is the reality. The reality is this, is that you look at his internals and – his odds of winning are basically directly correlating to his odds of getting a finish. Okay. Um, his odds for getting specifically a KO are only plus 215. You know, Lewis inside the distance, just to, yeah, he's like plus 210 inside the distance. And for a 70, a 7K flat fighter, that is, that is, that is really strong. But let me ask you this is that, I'm thinking out loud. Is that that much better than, say, Kutalaba? Well, it's, it's 400 less. Um, so not only is it better inside the distance, probably it's also 400 less. So Does Kutalaba have a little takedown upside to offset that? I don't know. So Derek Lewis does have, you know, is one of the best plays. And considering what I just said, that Spivak is probably the best overall play on the slate, um, if that's the case, then by definition, he's going to be really highly owned and Derek Lewis is going to be extreme leverage. And listen, obviously this should come as, you know, no surprise, but if you are live to anything in that last fight and you have Spivak and, and, and you just have no chance to get where you need to go, um, given where other people are ahead of you, you know what I'm saying? Um, then you should probably switch to, to, to Derek Lewis. Um, but again, these are, these are things that you should know instinctively. And unfortunately we can't, we you know, walk you through along the way. So let's just to finish our, our shell here. Let's, uh, let's replace, uh, Miles Johns. No, let's, so who's the next best, who, who would I, who would I get rid of to get, uh, Spivak in? Well, here's what you can do, right? What you could do is you could go, um, well, you can play Derek Lewis easily, but if you wanted to play, well, you can get rid of Miles Johns, for example. It's totally reasonable. You could play Derek Lewis, and if you did that, now you don't have to play. Um, what you call it, um, Kutalaba. I mean, I, I know, now you don't have to play what Jumagulov. Now you can go play one of these. Um, you know, you, you you know what you could even do at this spot. You could even play uh, Magdalena, who said you weren't going to be able to get in. You know, um, if you don't want to play Demopolis, let's say you wanted to play 
zoom a ghoul off there. Then you could add, see what Derek Lewis does for you? And then what you could do is, oh, well, then let's we'll flip this around. Let's go play uh, Speedback again. There you go. So you, you could play lots of, uh, lots of stuff here. I don't know if I recommend the Sherman thing. That's for something else. But in any case, um, not a lot of give actual lineups, but you'll see. Uh, those are what I consider the best plays and their proper approach to the slate. And uh, join me tomorrow for when we will go over the betting breakdown.